Happy New Year. It is so wonderful to see you in the sanctuary uh, for worship today. Before we begin worship, I do have a few announcements that I would like to bring to your attention. St. Paul is still in the process of raising money for Truth Spring. We are renovating a house in the North Highlands area that will become a daycare. These parents are, are given the opportunity to attend a training, a work training program. And without child care, they can't do it. Without child care, they can't hold on to a job. So this is vital for that community. Um, we would love for you to be able to make a contribution to this program, and you can do so by writing a check to St. Paul marked for the Truth Spring Project, or you can go to the Truth Spring website. The Rose Hill Safe House Ministry is still in need of clothing for men and women, in particular warm clothing, hats, gloves, scarves, coats, they would all be welcomed, and you may bring your donations here to the church. Our Real Women's Ministry will be meeting Thursday, January the 28th, and it will be All Things Ukraine, Part 2. Part 1 was in October, and we had so many things planned that we didn't get to all of them. So please join us for Part 2, and hear Tammy Reynolds give us an update on what's happening with our Ukrainian friends. The new year is here, and so are new opportunities for Bible study. Information about these may be found on our website, our Connect email, or you can just call the church office. But don't forget, your order of worship has a QR code, and you just hold your phone in the camera mode over it and click on the icon when, you get the, when you're prompted. The flowers on the sanctuary altar today are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Charlotte Hatcher Golden Boy, Grace Stacker Sprouse Cunningham, Susan Anderson Lamberth from the wedding of Susan Elizabeth Boyd and Daniel Thomas Wetland, Thursday, December 31st. Now, let's prepare our hearts for worship.
stand as you're able and sing hymn number 64, Holy, Holy, Holy. standing as we unite in the historic confession of the Christian Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence we shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. continue to stand for the reading of the scripture which comes from the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 10. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. 
to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. He has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things to him, these things in heaven and things on earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Please prepare your hearts for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with hopes and expectations for the new year. We are anxious to leave behind a year that has been filled with disappointments, with sadness, grief, and packed with frustrations and distrust. Our hope is that 2021 will be filled with joy and happiness, but you alone know what it holds for us, and only you can give us the strength and the wisdom we need to meet its challenges. We ask that you hold us in the palm of your hand and guide us as we face life's uncertainties. Father, how wonderful it is that you make all things new, that your mercies are new each morning. As we enter 2021, may the knowledge that you are faithful, that you keep your promise to never leave or forsake us, let it permeate our thoughts even as we pray the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Wayne. Would you join me in prayer, please? Gracious Heavenly Father, what has led up to this point, what will proceed from this point, we pray, O God, that it will be wrapped in your Holy Spirit, that through ordinary means of song and reading of Scripture and prayer and the speaking of your Word, that it would become good news for us. Lord, we don't have to imagine too far what good news would look like, especially, O God, from a bumpy and rough 2020. But Lord, as the song was sung, thanks be to you, our hearts are always grateful towards you. For you, O God, are outside of time and space, and you, God, are the one who holds us in the very palm of your hand. And not only that, O God, you whisper on the back of our neck that you are ours and we are yours. So we pray that during this time, that as the world stops for us for just a few moments, that we will reposition ourselves in front of the cross once again and be reminded of your faithfulness, of your goodness, of your grace in action. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. What is from you may it stick to our hearts. What is not from you may it fall to the ground and shatter. And this is all for your glory and your kingdom. I ask these things. Amen. Happy 2021. Yeah. Happy New Year. You, you can respond. Happy New Year. Yeah, there you go. I was just thinking about um, New Year's traditions. You thought I was going to say resolutions. You know, resolutions like exercising more and dieting. I made a resolution that I'm not going to re make a resolution to diet. In fact, I'm going to go out of my way not to diet. I'm just teasing. But traditions, I was thinking about traditions. And um, growing up, uh, we, we um, would stand on the porch of my grandma's house. And at midnight, we would take pots and pans, and we would pang, clang them together and yell, Happy New Year. I don't know what my neighbors would think if I did that now. But we also would have something special to eat. You here in the, now I guess I could say we, we in the South, we eat something like black-eyed peas or something, someone's, is that right, and cornbread? You know, yeah, I see a few nodded of heads. Up north, what we used to eat is pork and sauerkraut. I have no idea why sauerkraut. But I asked my grandma once, why do we eat pork on New Year's Eve? And I, look, my grandma and my grandfather, a few, they, they were someone who, if they didn't know the answer, they would make up one, and it was very believable. So I don't know if this is true or made up. I just accepted it. But the pig always burrows forward. Did you ever hear that? And so we eat pig and, and pork to, to, uh, to signify that we're still going forward. We're still going forward. Isn't it amazing what we remember? I think about all the things of my childhood and, and things like banging pots and pans and eating pork. I didn't eat the sauerkraut. I never liked sauerkraut. But eating all those things, those traditions and... Um, I often think, man, what, what, why did I remember that? Now having kids of our own, Lisa often turn our attention towards our kids, and, and we wonder in amazement, why do you remember some things and you don't remember other things? Our, our kids will remember when we make a, uh, a, a plan to go on vacation or go get ice cream or something special we're going to do for them, but they cannot remember to take out the garbage. <laughs> or make their bed, or put the laundry, even though it is, I might have only said ice cream once, they remember that, but after 15 times of make your bed, put away your clothes, they don't. I, I, it's amazing what uh, people remember, especially kids, and what they forget. One of the um, sacred moments, as one of your ministers I get to do, is is I get to sit with family members who have recently lost a loved one. And the world stops for them. It's certainly going on outside the, outside the room. But in this sacred moment, 
The family will not only talk about how they want their loved one remembered, they will also remember certain events. And when I move uh, into a pulpit where I'm about to deliver a eulogy, every single time just a thought flashes into my head. I wonder what my kids will remember about me. I wonder how I will be eulogized. That word eulogy has a very compartmentalized purpose in our world today. It's a Greek word, and many of you know that I'm sort of a word geek. I like to look at the etymology of different words and see how they unfold through history and how they were used in different scenarios and circumstances. This word eulogy is literally a word that means a good word. A good word. And certainly when you think about a eulogy in our context, you can't help get to that point where you think, man, this is a good word. It is a Greek word, and, and guess what? It's actually used in the Bible. Now, if you go into your concordance and look for the word eulogy and find out every place the word eulogy is used in the Bible, you're not going to find it. It was translated into English as something different, but the word is actually used in our passage. Paul uses it several times in the passage that Grace has read for us. In verse 3 of chapter 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Him with every spiritual blessing. Now right there, it's used three times. And the word that our, our most Bibles will translate it that into English is blessing. Now the context of Ephesians it's a beautiful book. It's six chapters, and the first three chapters are all centered around what God does. It talks about His mercy. It talks about His grace. It talks about His love. And nowhere do we find in these first three chapters any inkling of that this stuff from God is conditional. In other words, God's grace, God's love, God's mercy, they're not conditions, they're not given to us based on the condition if we act right, if we make our beds, if we take out our trash. See, Paul opens these, this section with these words, bless God who has blessed us. Blessed is that word, eulogy. A good word. And what's fascinating is this. What Paul is encouraging his readers to do is to have a good word for God or about God. But this good word for God or about God is framed in the context that we have a good word for God or about God because he has already a good word for us. The condition of God having this good word for us is not even here. We're encouraged just to respond. It's a present. It's an in-the-moment recognition sparked from the previous all-consuming attitude that God has had toward us. It's almost that you, you could say that this is the same as what Eugene Peterson, just how he describes prayer. He describes prayer not as first speech, as a speech or words that initiate a conversation, but they are second speech. That you are, you are just responding to God who has already initiated a conversation with us. And this good word, this blessing that God has, uh, that we are to give God, it is not first speech. 
It doesn't initiate God. It doesn't set Him into motion. It's not the condition of God's grace that we speak a good word about Him. It is a response to the blessing or the good word that He has said about us. In many ways, I think our culture or our society has lost this meaning of blessing. We, we might not just, we, we just don't put as much value on these good words in everyday contexts. But that wasn't the case for Paul's day. There's a long history in Scripture about blessings as they relate to a good word. Do you remember Jacob and Esau? Jacob was the one who stole Esau's birthright for a bowl of soup. And when the time came for the blessing to be given from Isaac to his children, specifically to Esau, the oldest, Jacob manipulates the scenario in such a way so that it's he who receives the blessing. Genesis 27 gives us a glimpse into what Esau saw and what his response, what he was feeling. As soon as Esau heard that Jacob had his father's blessing, he cried out exceedingly with a great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Isaac responded, Behold, I've already blessed him. I've already made him Lord over you and all his brothers. What can I do for you now, my son? And Esau responds, But don't you have just one more blessing for me? Bless me, even me also, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and he wept. Later on, Jacob is coming back from Uncle Laban's, where he now has his wife. And once again, this word in the Old Testament, you start to see the importance of what it meant that was carried through to what Paul was referring to. Jacob is wrestling with God in Genesis 32, and when day breaks, the Lord says to him, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob responded, I will not let you go unless you bless me. For fear of blessing becoming convoluted with God bless you after someone sneezes. Or a few words that are, that are spoken before eating a meal. Let us not lose sight at how important the implications of what this word meant in the culture that Paul lived in. Paul does not leave us to guess what this word, this good word, this blessing means from God. He expands that this good, that this is not just a good word. He expands how God takes this word and starts to live into an action. In verse 4 and 5, he chose us to be holy and blameless. In verse 5, he destined us for adoption. He chose us and he destined us to be a part of of his family. Those aren't just words. Those are the beginning, the inklings of this word in action, of what it means that God has blessed us. Before the foundation of the world, you were on God's mind. Before one creative word was spoken and creation leapt into existence, you could say that you were a picture that God hung on his refrigerator. And that, that, that action 
starts to live into the ultimate goal of what he wanted for us to be a part of his family. In verse 7, we start to get a glimpse of what is the predicate or what the catalyst is for this action in God. We have redemption through his blood of Christ, through the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Redemption, forgiveness, all according to his rich grace towards us us. This is the catalyst. This is what frames how he speaks about us and how he sees us. His grace had been set into motion before we even took our first breath. If you're like me, your mind may jump to the conclusion to where we say, well, that's all well and good, Paul. That was in the past. That was then. But what about now? What about in my life? What about in my family? What about in my 2021? It's easy to start to believe that there is no more forgiveness left from God. And we believe that because we start to to do the same thing with our relationship with God as we do with our earthly relationships. Well, so-and-so hasn't forgiven me. Why would God forgive me? We might believe that, man, God, I am not redeemable. I have gone past that line. I'm not good enough to be adopted Because so-and-so hasn't accepted me either. God, you've done this in the past because of your grace, but I've used it all up. I have squandered your grace. Certainly, you've had enough of me. And if we're not careful, we'll pass over verse 8. Because what Paul does in verse 8 is he anticipates this response. And he tells us that this conclusion, however logical we get, logically we get to it, is not acceptable. In verse 8, this grace, which is that bedrock of God's character, that, that catalyst that sets his words into motion, is a grace that he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. I haven't used the word lavished that much lately. But once, once again, my word geekness jumps into motion. And what I recognize is that this word is used some other place in the New Testament, several other places. It's used in the Gospels. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? Mark, uh, rather, Matthew 14 shares with us the details. He takes a few loaves and a couple fish, and he feeds a multitude of people. Remember that? The disciples take 12 baskets, and they start distributing this food. And in verse 20 of Matthew 14, it says this, And they all ate, and they were satisfied. Now get that picture. They, were, they had all eaten, and they were satisfied. And afterwards, they took up 12 basketful of broken pieces left over. That same word is used here for that image of leftover as Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8. This grace he has lavished upon us. 
this word picture from Matthew. Allow it, allow yourself to see the picture of God's grace for you. Even when you think that you have exhausted it all, that, there, that you have used up all of his grace using this word, with that word picture from the feeding of the multitude, there is an abundance still left over waiting to be tapped into. When you think you have been satisfied with God's grace, His word in action. There is an abundance that is left over. Paul is not just saying that God has a good word for us. It is this word in action. Literally, the word. As you reread these verses, you'll start to see that all of this is, is, is wrapped in the work of Christ. In Him, through Him, His blood. It's as if God sees us through the lens of what Christ did. And if you need a picture of what this looks like, when Jesus came and walked this earth, he did not just stand on the Mount of Olives and yell out to anyone who could hear his voice and say, I love you, and then turn around and go back up to heaven. But he demonstrated his love. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is grace in action. Which, if you think about it, is what grace is all about, isn't it? I mean, is grace really grace if grace is withheld? Is grace really grace if grace is withheld? Wouldn't it just be good intentions? That's not the God that we serve. A God of good, just good intentions. This is a God of action. This grace in action is what we respond to with a good word about God. This is what we celebrate in verse 6 of chapter 1 of Ephesians. To the praise of His glorious grace which He has blessed us. We praise. We have a good word because He has a good word for us, about us. And He has put it in action. And this is all very descriptive of the very character of who God is. God's grace is lavished. It's not metered out. God's grace is intimate. It's close. It is not distant. His grace is real. It's not just pie in the sky. And all of this is made possible through Jesus Christ. As it comes to that climactic point in verse 6, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has blessed us. This is not the same word from verse 3. This is that climactic point where Paul gets to that he says this is the action. This is where it all comes down to the rubber meeting the road with which this glorious grace that he has for us, the lens through which he has seen, sees us all made possible through Jesus Christ, this is with which he has blessed us in him or in the beloved. 
And to get an idea of what this means as I bring this to a close, there is one other place in the New Testament that this word is used. This word, karitao, is used in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. When the angel comes to Mary, what does the angel say? Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now Mary, Luke tells us that Mary is greatly troubled And tries to discern what this kind of greeting is like. And and look, I would be too, all right? O favored one is that same word that Paul uses in Ephesians 1 6. The picture is this God didn't just from a distance say, Mary, you're favored. Mary, I have a good word about you and for you. Mary, let me tell you what I think about you. It was really God stepping into her narrative and say this, I am going to pour my grace into you. In action. If we were to empathize with Mary, we'd have a lot of questions, right? What does this mean? I'm just a virgin. How is this going to happen? But notice how Mary responds in verse 38. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. If I'm not careful, what I find myself doing many times is trying to figure out everything. Before I make a decision, I try to go down every path and, and think down through and what, what, what will this action mean and how the, will the trajectory, where will that take me? And in many ways, this is good. I could imagine that this is something that Mary is going through too. How do I tell my parents this? Wouldn't that be an awkward conversation? How do I tell Joseph this? I mean, she had no idea that Joseph had received a very similar word. What about Joseph's parents? How would the community see her? Not just in the immediate, but for the rest of her life. She had no way of seeing what Herod was going to do just a few years later to the children under the age of two. Or what 33 years later, what it would be like to stand at the foot of the cross and watch Jesus die. But before she had everything figured out, she said this, let it be for me, let it be to me according to your word. What if we didn't have it all figured out before we prayed? What if we didn't have it all figured out before we brought God into The picture. You might be wondering why I entitled this sermon, Ask Great Things. It comes from a sermon title by William Carey. William Carey in church history is thought to be the father of mission work. He entitled a sermon, Ask Great Things, Expect Great Things. Later on, he put... Uh, two prepositional phrases on it. Ask great things from God. Ex- uh, ask great things uh, from God. Expect great things from God. This week, it's centered around this idea of asking great things. Next week, we'll talk about expect great things, how it closely ties with this sermon. But if you're like me, many of us push back on asking God great things. We want to hedge our bets. We want to make it as vague as possible, don't we? Because we think it rises and falls on our history. But take a picture from Paul and his writing to that church in Ephesus. That it is not about you and 
me. God's grace, God's good word, God's grace in action has nothing to do with a conditional statement that we have to do something first. See, God is the one who initiated the conversation. God is the one who has set this into motion. Paul reminds us that God has spoken a good word about us before we took our first breath. He has lavished us with his grace in action. He has poured into our narrative like he poured into Mary's. And none of this was because of what we could ever offer God, but because of Jesus Christ. Do you know what I hope my kids remember? I hope that they remember that my love for them was not conditional. I hope that they remember that, I, that, that their mother and I love them just because they breathe. What would 2021 be like for you if you reimagined your relationship with God through this lens? Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to allow, O God, your Spirit to, to weave into us your word for us. A good word, a word of forgiveness, redemption, adoption, a word of being accepted. And allow this, O God, to to initiate a trajectory that we could not even imagine, we can't even figure out, resulting from you, O God, pouring into us. It's in your name we pray and ask these things. Amen. If you have your hymnal or if you would grab a hymnal from the pew back in front of you and turn to page 12. Would you hear this invitation? Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you hear the good news? Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that is proof of God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread 
He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my, bo- my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. You've been given a uh, packet, a communion packet. Go ahead and peel back the top, take the uh, wafer, and peel back the second layer and the juice. Realizing that this is the body and the blood of Christ that has been broken and poured out for you for the remission of sins. Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn is hymn number 393. Please take a hymnal. Stand as you are able and join us in singing. Before our benediction, I want to ask our ushers to come down to give us direction as we leave. And now would you receive this benediction. May the God who holds you in the palm of His hand, who has poured out grace so lavishly that where is more abundant, there is a more abundance of grace that is yet to be tapped into Be the God who holds you in the palm of his hand today, tomorrow, and the year to come. 
Amen.